My guest today is Mario Morea, a highly accomplished, influential and collaborative agile transformation leader, change agent and enterprise coach. He is the author of five leading edge agile and business related books. Two most recent examples include the Agile Enterprise and Being Agile. He is also the writer of the Agile Adoption blog and has had more than 100 articles published. Let's get on with the show and let me introduce you to Mario now. I'm ready. Hi, Mario. Um, welcome to the Transformation Leaders podcast. It's uh, I'm delighted that you've been able to join us today. Uh, I'm looking forward to this conversation, actually. I've been looking forward to it for a few weeks since we had our introductory discussion. I think there's uh, a lot of your uh, experience is very relevant to this audience. Um, and uh, you know, that, that significant experience that you have around change and transformation. So I'm sure you'll be able to share some real great insights today. Um, but before we get into the detail, um, if you could just introduce yourself, tell us a little bit about your background, where you've come from, and ultimately how you got into change and transformation in the first place. Sure, sure. Well, first, thank you for uh, allowing me to be on your podcast. This is excellent. I'm really happy about the the theme of transformation. I think a, a sorely missed theme for many folks. They get right into things without really understanding the elements and components of what it means to tr transform. And they almost treat it like a salt shaker, like, yeah, we're going to do a little transformation. And well, yeah. that is completely different than what an actual transformation is meant to be. So you ask, who am I? My name is Mario Moreta. I have been in the field for 20 something plus years. Mm -hmm. um, I primarily started more in the uh, configuration management, uh, build release engineering uh, area, where interestingly, while it feels like it should be more tactical, you started seeing the problems that were behind everything that you're dealing with at the moment for something like a simple build. Like, why did the problem occur in the first place? And now you start to backtrack. Well, because there weren't any coding practices. Oh, and let's go back. Well, the requirement wasn't written very clearly. And now let's go back. People didn't really understand what the requirement was. There wasn't an actual product owner to or product manager to really clearly own that piece of work. And it really starts to help me set up and understand everything that's behind it. From that, I got more into like architecture because there was a lot of architecture involved, configuration management. And of course, you know, programming and things. At one point, though, I made the shift into understanding sort of organizational process as it relates to how things are built. And maybe we can build things better, like enterprise architecture. Let's actually use the same, you know, stacks of technologies and things like that. So when we try to integrate, maybe the world could be a little bit better. And so I started to uh, embark on what I conceptually would call transformation without necessarily calling it transformation, but the whole change management process, because I was constantly having to change the way people will work in you know, ways people are working. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And so at some point I got into agile because agile was a new way of working for some of my engineering teams and so forth, more iterative and incremental. And I was initially working actually with Ken Schwaber, who's the co-founder of Scrum. And because I brought him into uh, my company at the time. And what was interesting is, is as we were working with it, because I was more interested in new ways of working, engineering, fast feedback, things like that. I realized there were a lot of other aspects that weren't included in Scrum, the which is an agile uh, framework and process. And I realized there's a much bigger world that you have to change in order to really do an iterative and incremental framework. Mm -hmm. And so that really, I would say, launched my focus into transformation because it effectively required a transformation. A lot of people, even to this day, will will do agile. And it's really just like I was mentioning a shaker thing. Let's let's do a daily stand-up, yet they would still do it in the old mindset, which then would last like an hour instead of the 15 minutes brevity. And they would focus all their you know, um, attention to the project manager as opposed to each other. And they would focus on just accomplishments as opposed to impediments to get things out of the way and, and so forth. And I realized at a certain point, the mindset shift is very important. And of course, in the topic of transformation, it's highly important. 
Yeah, absolutely. And so from there, yeah, yeah. From there, I went into, I started doing this a couple of times. I got hired by companies who wanted actual ad, wholesale agile transformations. And so I was, you know, lucky enough in my first company, it was a big financial company, to experiment along the way because any transformation, and we'll get into this in more detail, it does require context and understanding how things are currently working in order to make that change. Because a big part of to me transformation is a re-engineering of ways of working, right? It's you're you have a starting point that could be, you know, not quite so good. It could be challenging. And how do you then make that shift into the the, the direction that you'd have to go? So I got into Agile in a big way and helped companies do Agile transformations, recognizing that it isn't a one-stop shop, recognizing that it is it is also in a continuous adaptation, you know, iterative and incremental approach just for the transformation, which is very much Agile. That's kind of why transformation to me was like made a lot of sense. In Agile, it's iterative and incremental. Well, so is transformations because you're constantly learning about the company as you trying to embark on the transformation because no matter what, how much you think you know up front, you will be constantly learning, right? And I'm sure in your experience, you've seen that as well. Yeah, I, I, I think the, the whole concept of transformation in a straight line is just fictitious. It's, there's, oh, the no. thing grazes all the way, isn't there? And it's this, uh, often a squiggly line that um, gets you to where you need to be, um, but very yeah. rarely can you go there in a straight line. and. Uh, um, going into transformations with that mindset is is critical. Uh, yeah, and and as a result, as a result of that, I um, I ended up writing some books. Some uh, publishing houses asked me to write some books. Um, one of them uh, called Being Agile, which was much more about the mindset shift. Yeah, which is to me important in transformations. And then I eventually got to the what I call enterprise agile enterprise building and uh, running an agile organization. And these two books, particularly Being Agile, really helped me get my thoughts on paper. And I, I don't write stuff until I've actually experimented with things and so forth and tried it. And so this has really helped me understand that a transformation, you know, it's one thing to say, I'm going to implement Scrum and there's some mechanics and stuff. It's a whole other thing to say, well, we need a wholesale transformation in this company to really do Agile well. Which is which is interesting because you I think you've covered a little bit of this off, but uh, just again to build the context context for the rest of the discussion, it'd be good if you could give me a a, dis, uh, a distinct definition or how you define transformation. Um, it is uh, is an inter an interesting way of of building that context for the rest of the conversation. So I look as a transformation as a thorough change in behavior behavior in your context and this includes a change in culture people and technology or it may involve all three typically a transformation should imply a better life and more success for your company that usually is some goal in, you know for example i was working at a, a big retail company who hadn't really embarked seriously on e-commerce and they kept wondering why is e-commerce beating us and so I had to help to make this whole mindset transition to why e-commerce is the new way of selling products and services and so it this is what I mean by it should imply you know better business mm -hmm. uh, I mean from a business perspective this often means new ways of working new ways of thinking and of course, meaning that you should be adapting to the marketplace and your customer needs. Now, it's also important as part of the definition to be clear that a transformation is a journey. It's going to take time and requires a lot of thinking. In fact, I will say the mindset is the big part of a transformation within the organization. And so I'll often say towards the middle of an agile transformation, those who are really getting what it is we're doing in our ways of working, I'll apologize to them. And the reason why I apologize is you now have made that shift, that transformational mindset shift that will unfortunately 
have you not wanting to work for the more traditional companies and the old ways of working? Because now, you know, it's clear to you for some people, once they kind of like make that shift that, wow, there is a better way. And so I think that's generally encompasses my definition of transformation. It's really a combination of behaving differently, culture, people, technology, a, a you know focus on success, better better working uh, conditions, better working environment, more success of the company because the world is adapting, and yeah. it's time that you need to adapt with that. Yeah, there's a couple of things there that you brought out. I think that the whole concept of people moving through that transformation at different paces is 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 key, and and, and understanding that people will move through the transformation at, at their, their own pace. And some might not even come along on that on that journey, uh, which is which is understandable. Yes, that will be a part of my message here is exactly that. And so I know that from from you know what is a transformation, uh, what are some of the, the essential components of a successful transformation? Right. I know you've talked uh, great about that and you've just touched on one of the areas that I. You have to be sensitive about this. Yet it's still going to be important, and that's some people aren't going to make the journey. So when you talk about people, you are, in fact, talking about. Some people with the right mindset and some people who might be what I call detractors. And so I wrote an article a while ago because this became crystal clear to me. It's called Agile Personality Types. And if you just search on Agile Personality Types, you'll find it. That there are personality types such as innovators, champions, workhorses that are going to help you in that transformation. But then you need to be aware that there is deceiver, deniers, cowboys Mm -hmm. that are going to detract you. And I have to say, in many of my transformation efforts that I've been involved with, there is often a shedding of detractors. And part of it is, it's their decision, right? It's like, hey, this is where we're going. You either align with it or you don't. Yeah, and and I think sometimes organizations are afraid of that. They're afraid of being clear about where they're going um, with the transformation. So what does the future look like? Um, and part of that um, that fear is because there's an acceptance that actually some people probably won't want to go on that journey with them. And, and it, it's that balance between being open and transparent in terms of the communication, but actually not wanting people to leave too early. And, and in many instances, I, I think that's a, that's that fear, it doesn't come to reality. So if people do, if people choose to leave, then actually, some uh, in, in many cases, that's 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 positive for the transformation, in my experience. Very rarely do people choose to leave that you really want to keep within the business. Um, that is, do you share that? Is that something that you've found? Yeah, and so as part of the transformation journey, you know, we are talking about people, yeah, and it's very important to incorporate people into the mix and to start to identify who is going to be good and healthy for this journey and who isn't. Mm -hmm. It's important then to those who may not may be distractors to give them the choice. So this isn't a, um, you know, black and white thing, but here's the choice. This is our direction. This is where we're planning to go. Do you want to be on board or not? And if they don't, then they have that choice. Now, those who are the champions, what I call the champions, you ensure you do more care and feeding with them. You make them champions, you establish that role, you give them additional education because you want them to become part of the the what I call the leadership, the lowercase l leadership, because they're the ones who are going to more likely be locally involved in many, many things. And so um, this, uh, this definitely applies to teams. It can apply to management. Um, and so that's really important. And so another group that I include in the people bucket is customers. Mm-hmm. Oftentimes in transformations, there's a we forget to ensure the customers are aware of the transformation involved and what we would like their role to be. 
because we find we get a lot of great feedback from customers and it can also help us adapt our transformation. Like, are we thinking the right things? Because as I mentioned, oftentimes transformations are to adapt to the marketplace, whatever marketplace you're in and customer needs. And so getting that continuous customer feedback is, is super important in that case. Absolutely critical. And it's interesting, one what, what of the things that we talk about within um, the, the nine pillars of the Transformation Leaders Body of Knowledge Framework is we call it stakeholder stroke partners, but it, but it, and customers are obviously one of those core stakeholders, but it's it's the the wider internal external stakeholders that, that are critical in getting them involved. They are people and they will have a critical role in the success of the transformation, irrespective of whether they're employees, part of the team, part of the organization, or suppliers, or partners, or customers. As you say, it's critical that we're transparent and people understand where we're moving towards um, and give them that option in that and support them to come on the journey with you but accept that some of those people customers suppliers partners as well as employees maybe decide not to mm -hmm. yeah absolutely and i think you know the the reason why i've always been attracted to agile is, is agile basically says the one thing that is constant is change, right? We, but it's not just agile. Many, you know, smart uh, theories talk about this. And so it's better to ensure we're working in a framework in the company where we're constantly adapting to change because it's inevitable, mm -hmm. right? And so you really do need people, you know, people, management, team, stakeholders, clients, customers who understand that. And most of them do. However, as we were mentioning, there are going to be some people who are hardwired in a certain way of thinking, and there's no judgment. It's just maybe they aren't suited for where you're headed. Agreed. Right. And, and like you say, that change is inevitable. And actually, the speed of change is not getting any... In, in, in fact, it's, it's getting quicker. You know, the, the, mm -hmm. the volume and the speed of technology now uh, and new technologies coming on. There's, Two years time, there'll be stuff that's hitting all organizations that we don't even know about at the moment. The, the, the speed of idea through to implementation is that much quicker, isn't it? And, and having that mindset and that approach and that culture to lean into change, I think is a critical success factor for lots of organizations moving forward and individuals. Yeah, and you touched, yeah, and you just touched on a second one. So I said people, culture, and technology. technology it, you know, there's digital transformations often involve a lot of uh, technology, merging technologies, which is what you're highlighting that just come out of nowhere, that we better be ready to grasp onto those or certainly experiment with understanding what value they provide. And it could be just whole new ways like e-commerce was a whole new way to uh, commence commerce through technology. Right. Ever before now, it's pretty much pervasive, whereas, you know, 20 years ago, it didn't exist. And so always being in tune with technology. And that's why the technology piece is always critical and can't be forgotten as you go through this. And so you should always have a technology focus and partners involved in that. And this is where a lot of times I'll talk to customers because customers will be like, well, the reason why you're not getting any feedback on this platform is because most of us are using this platform. And so then, okay, let's go back and reprioritize that new, you know, social media platform where we're much more likely to get 10x more feedback. Mm -hmm. And in fact, in some work with this pharmaceutical company that works also a lot with doctors, we started learning that. Like, why weren't we getting feedback from doctors? It's like, well, they're using a whole different platform and then then we thought and so once we learned that we basically got our, our customer focus team to help us well you know who's using that kind of social uh, media platform today and how do we start to you know get tech you know some technology people engaged in that within our within our effort as well yeah, yeah. so that covers um people and then technology and of course the big one i when and when i say think about transformation as I think about culture, mm -hmm. right? And 
culture to me is a combination of values, language, norms, and rituals. And so it's a lot of things. And the first I'll talk about is values. Like in order to have, in order to adapt a culture, you need to talk about what values you are focused on. And luckily in the agile world, there's actually the agile manifest talks about agile values and principles. And so it presents us with values that a, a lot of very smart people talked about. And it doesn't mean that's the that's all we look at, but it, it'll talk about things like in, you know individuals and interactions over process and tools. So it's saying it's not that process and tools aren't important, but how people interact is more important, right? And then another one is working software over comprehensive documentation. And what that means is customers, our clients, our shareholders wants us to actually see working product, working software, working technology over a, you know, a big thick document. Right. And then a, a third one is customer collaboration over contract negotiation. And what this means is have a relationship with your customers. Yes, of course, there's going to be contract negotiations, but build that, make make more of an effort for that customer um, relationship. And then the last is responding to change over following a plan. Which, of course, what we've both been talking about, the marketplace is constantly changing, customer needs are changing. And it, if you have a culture that's still sticking to that plan, and I have seen even to this day companies that do that, that's just not going to work. It's interesting you should and, leave that the, the, the culture aspect to the last of the three, because uh, that is the big one, isn't it? It's the and and it's the hardest one to change, um, and all too often it's ignored, and and it, it's one of the things that trip organisations up. Um, what other things do you, have you found through your career? You've, you've worked in lots of organizations. You've worked in numerous different sectors. And, you know, what common themes that, have, that you've seen that trip organizations up as they go through that sort of transformation process? Yeah, tripping them up is interesting. So, you know, one of the big ones that I'll see is, um, well, we've kind of already touched on it, and that's just having the wrong people. and so. We do need to take that so seriously, identifying who are the right and who are the wrong people, particularly people in leadership. And having done this now quite a few times, I can tell usually within like 10 to 15 minutes of talking to someone that oh, they're probably not the best person for the position that they're in. It doesn't mean that I won't give them a chance. I mean, maybe through some education and things like that. However, at a certain point, it's like, that's the big thing that trips organizations up. It's just, you have that detractor who's in charge of too many people or it is in charge of processes, like project management processes that continue to say, plan it all up front and things like that. So having people who are focused on ensuring certain processes are still stuck with that aren't in fact going to help your transformation because it's like it doesn't allow for adaptation and, and change and things like that. And so that's one. The other part is driving with metrics before you understand what metrics you really need. Mm -hmm. And so what I mean by this, I often say, let's start a, a, a metrics program on our transformation. First, let's just measure as norm. What is the norm? What's normal? Before you start attaching goals. Because what trips a lot of uh, transformations up are people start to aim for the, the measure with uh, completely ignoring anything else because it's like, I'm probably going to get a bigger bonus if I focus on that goal, even though it may be completely wrong for the transformation. Yeah. And so I, I've seen a lot of transformation startup measure metrics programs and they immediately put a target and it's like, no, just, just allow yourself to measure with no targets because we need to know what the norm is and you may you know adapt measures because you know like well, there's there's a recent study that like only like 12% of measures are actually used by organizations and you got to know what to peel away because you know many of certainly well more than half are not helping you especially in a transformation you have to reimagine what measures and metrics are and if you're using them be be very careful on 
what you actually ask people to follow. And a lot of this, I mean, by like, you know, MBOs, objectives, and things like that, that um, organizations will have their employees track to. And of course, as an employee, it's like, I'm going to, you know, if this says I have to have 10 defects found, I'm going to find 10 defects. You know, it's like, that's it. But that may not actually help. I I think on that one, what what I've seen uh, numerous times is, is that, as the transformation progresses and um, the activities that we want individual teams to focus on change, there's a lag between change in the KPIs or the performance measures of that team. So you, you know, the transformation is trying to go turn left um, and, and, and actually the, the performance measures and KPIs are still dragging them to turn right. And you, you're then left with individuals saying, well, if I go down the route that you want me to go down as a transformation lead, then you, it's having a detrimental impact upon my career or my performance rating at the end of the year. And that and, and getting all of that tied in together so that the KPIs, the performance measures, the um, annual performance rewards are all uh, changing as we go through the transformation is, is critical. Yeah. But it's tripped up so many, or st- not necessarily tripped them up so that they, they, they completely fall off track, but delayed the impact and delayed the benefit realisation on so many of the programmes uh, because people have, haven't really thought through how we want people to change the detailed job how that's going to change and what we want them to focus on as we go through the transformation. They just say, we're here now, ultimately we want we to get there. But if that's a two-year program or a 12-month program, it's not going to be, we, you do nothing for two years. We, we need people to, to systematically go through the change during that two-year period, don't we? Yeah, and this gets back to when I was talking about culture, I, I mentioned values already, right? And there's agile values. However, if you don't don't have values and principles already predefined, of course, you can adapt them. You need to think about, well, what what are the organization's values? Meaning once we're here, once we are at, once we have transformed, what are those values look like? And you need to state them way back here, you know, way back here, sorry, way back here to get to there. (laughs) And so that's the first, what you're talking about, what I call norms, like, the norms of an organization, like which is performance evaluation, right? Like we need to reevaluate the norm of how we do that and understand that the the current norms of, of measures and metrics may not suit us for the journey. And so we need to reevaluate all the current norms. And a lot of times organizations don't even know what norms they have. Yeah. It, they've just been doing things and they just make assumptions. Of course, that has a direct impact on culture. Right. It's like if the norm is you better just follow your, you know, you know, management objectives, right? KPIs, that's what I'm gonna do, because that's the norm. It's like, and I get paid out. Well, you better reevaluate a lot of that. And as part of culture, that's often forgotten. So that's another norm. And of course, there's there's team norms, like teams should have a decision making capability, so they should decide how they're gonna operate and so forth. Another part of culture to me is language. And so like, what are you hearing? And, and oftentimes this is also how I evaluate people. Like what language are they using? You know, like, for example, are they saying, you know, after, let's say after you hypothetically do six months of the transformation, you're educating folks and new ways of thinking, new ways of working. And then you start talking with a group and, you know, the leader is still saying, when are we going to meet the deadline, <laughs> you know, or or something like that versus when are we going to deliver value? Let's say value is your driver, right? You start to tune into like, what kind of language are people using? And, and is it really helping this organization? Because, you know, it's, it's as simple as it may sound, but a poorly constructed sentence that's shared to an organization, like, when are you going to meet your deadline? completely tells the organization, "Ah, I guess we're not serious about our transformation because the leader is saying this, right? And so that's another aspect. And of course, there's rituals. Rituals are, you know, like our ritual is 
year, yearly planning. Well, we, you know, the new ritual needs to be quarterly or continuous planning, let's say an example. And, and, and I, I usually use this analogy. So I'll ask the question to you, um, I'll say in the UK and the US, what does a typical lunch look like in a corporate setting? What is a typical lunch? Like it's lunchtime. What do we do now? What does it look like? Give me an example. Um, I, I think it depends upon which organization you work for. A lot of in the UK, there are a lot of people oh, historically when when lots of people were in offices and we're still uh, a lot of a lot of organizations in the UK are still trying to get more people back into the offices after COVID. There's that homework in has, has changed changed the world really for lots of organizations. But going back to your question, um there, there, there is a, a general acceptance in many organizations that you work through your lunch. So you run out, you get a sandwich, you get yourself a coffee, you come back at your desk and you're still interacting on, on the laptops. You're not getting the break, if, if that makes sense. Yeah, exactly. The 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 ritual uh of lunch and, and the culture it creates is get through it as fast as possible, process foods whatever you can get in just for fuel to continue working, right? Now let's take a look at what lunch looks like in, in a small Italian uh, city or town where it's much more focused on quality, experience, you know, lint, instead of paper towels, it's linen, you know, napkins and, and so forth. And that's a real ritual or a cultural difference and that's the example I often try to use for people where, you know, depending on what, what you're doing today, you know, what, what kind of culture do you want? Do you want a culture where you're just basically gulping down lunch for fuel just so you can get going? Or do you really want the experience? And I'm not judging either one. A transformation, however, is going from one to the other. And that could be one example. Now, of course, it could be many things. It can going from, you know, yearly planning to continuous planning and, and so forth. So, but it's important for people to understand like, wow, there's a whole different way of thinking and working between each one of those. No, absolutely. And um, I've just come out of an organization leading a, a global transformation. Um, and... Those rituals are so important to understand because in the UK, it may be acceptable or, uh, or um, the norm to work through your lunch. But if you're then dealing, uh, if you're setting up a meeting with another country and a person within another country whose rituals are not to take time out to go and do whatever, meditation or whatever it is, but you're forcing them to have that meeting at the time that suits you that you're working through. That's going to break that. It's that coming back to that communication again that we mentioned. It's just going to break down that culture that you're trying to create. Um, and mm -hmm. the, the other thing, the other point I would like, uh, like to go back to is your point around leadership communication. And a lot of a lot of organisations have a great degree of focus upon the official communications, the, the, um, you know, the formal communication, um, the big global presentations, the key, keynote speeches, et cetera, et cetera. But actually, it's the informal communications that really matter. And if those two are not aligned, if, if you're saying one thing in, in a big presentation to, to the whole team, but actually, in one-to-one -one conversations, you're saying something different. That those di that difference will be very, 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 very quickly grabbed hold of, um, and can very easily derail a, a major transformations. Yeah, and so you you bring up another angle that I look at when I talk about what would make a transformation successful. So and initially we, we were talking about, you know, culture, people, um, and technology. So you need to focus on all those parts. Another way I look at it, and it was particularly written in my book, Being Agile, and that's you need to treat a transformation as a real initiative. Mm -hmm. Now, as as for me and you, probably as obvious as that sounds, 
I have seen many organizations embark on a transformation and it's not treated like the rest of the work. It's sort of like, you know, just do it in your part time or, you know, let's not take it. it yes, it's serious, but it's not that serious. So another angle that I look at transformation is it must be treated like a first class work entity, aka initiative, whatever you want to call it, initiative, epic, program, don't care what the word is, but it's serious. It should be clearly stated as a priority within the organizational context. Um, and so that's the first, very first part, because if it's not, People are going to look at their priority list and say, this is what I'm going to focus on, right? And so, so that's the first part. The second part is objectives and scope. Like, if you have a transformation, when I say treat it like an initiative, tell me the objective. This could be sharing the values that we talked about and, and things like that. And what's the scope? Is it the entire organization or is it a division or whatever it is? Be crystal clear, just like any kind of initiative, project, program, be crystal clear on what that is. The next part is you must have a transformation team. Yeah. This can't be done part-time. I know people try to, and it doesn't mean you can't have some part-time people. It just means if you're treating a, an initiative like a first-class entity of work, there is a project leader or a scrum master or a product manager, whatever term you want to use there needs to be a leader and oh by the way there needs to be a sponsor and oh by the way there needs to be a team of champions coaches and you know combination and so it needs to be clearly thought out because i have seen so many transformation efforts in the agile space fail because you know we're going to pick those 10 people and it's going to be 20 percent of their effort to me, as if it's 20% of their effort, it might as well be no effort, no percentage of their effort, unless it's 50-50. But even then, I can't tap you and say, hey, I'm going to get 50% of your time without releasing 50% of your work, right? And so it is super, super critical to think of a transformation to be supported by a transformation team. And so that's very important. Another aspect is you eventually need to have a champion of ne a network of champions, lo local people. And so what I have learned is if you hire, if a company hires a bunch of external consultants, and you know, and I'm, a, I'm an external consultant in many cases, but oftentimes I end up getting hired internally because a company start to realize like, oh, we need to have people who really are on side. External consultancy, you come in, they quote unquote, make the change and then they leave and then the transformation falls apart. Have you ever witnessed anything like that? I'm curious. Absolutely. Uh, and, and I totally agree. I think um, the first question that we, we asked on the podcast is how you define transformation. My definition of transformation is the, the, it's a significant change. It's not just change. It's not incremental change. You're moving an organization from point A to point B. And, and coming back to your point about how that is sponsored, in my world, the transformation director or the chief transformation officer is on that senior leadership group. It is a direct report of the chief exec, ideally, or certainly of the you know that senior leadership team as a, as an absolute minimum. Um, but it's coming back to your question. I find all too often organisations will appoint people into that role that have got no change in transformation experience in the past. They would never appoint a, 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 a chief finance officer that's not got any finance background. They would never appoint a chief information officer that's not got no technology background. But all too often, they will appoint a, trans, a, a chief transformation officer or a transformation director that's never delivered change in transformation. And, and that, it's it's a big frustration of, of mine, and, and uh, that's one of the reasons I think that um, or, uh, organizations get it wrong. It trips them up to some extent. Mm -hmm. That op opens the door for people like you and I to go in and, 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 and resolve it and help. But it's it, it's a fundamental frustration of mine that 
treat, as you said, treat it seriously, put the right resources in place and release the right resources to ensure that it can be successful. Because you don't want yeah. to set a programme up, go out with the big vision and then tie people up, um, hamstring them in terms of giving them the opportunity to actually deliver against it. Yeah, I have this saying that if you've never been there, how do you know where you're going? Yeah. To me, uh, align with hiring the wrong people who've never done transformation. They're never going to know because they've never been there. And so it's it's like saying, you know, hey, we're going to, you know, I have no experience in climbing this mountain, and but I'm going to be the leader. <laughs> it's like, oh, that's, you know, you're dooming not just the, the transformation, but everybody along the way. You could get them stuck into, you know, crevices and valleys and, and, and ice and snow, and it's terrible, terrible for everybody. And so I do, I also believe though that you should hire some experienced consultants, contractors, and, and so forth, coaches to get you started and to potentially go along the way, but you shouldn't hire everyone outside. Oh, and no. that gets back to, yeah, yeah, and this gets back to building a network of local champions, right? And so I, I imagine both you and I have <laughs> got benefited from transformations that it's sort of their second start because the first start was people that just didn't get, um, just weren't on top of the game, right? And so as part of that, um, I think, you know, a, a smart person will, as you say, hire someone who actually has that experience or get consultants or contractors to get you started in the right direction. Um, secondly, build that network of local champions. And so what I have found in great success of transformations is once you've got things well established, you might have experimented a little bit and so forth, you start to build those local uh, champions, people who are very interested, very excited. These are the, what I was talking about, the agile personality types, innovators and um, champions and workhorses who really want to help help out. And they're now all mixed in. And I usually have them actually do the initial training because then their, their local friends see that they're the ones doing this as opposed to some transformation guy. And so for, I'll buddy up with them early on just to make sure things are going properly and answering questions and so forth. But it really tends to start accelerating. That's the key. It starts to accelerate the transformation um, part. So yeah. again, I mean, go ahead. No, I was, all I was going to say that, uh, Mario is, is that I, I think moving forward, um, even more so now than it's ever been before, the people with those um, ch that change mindset, with those change skills, are going to thrive in organisations because, as we've said many times, change is inevitable. Uh, and, and I think one of the things that I'd like to, you know, things like this podcast to help um, and, and other things that are out there is to try to... No, I was going to say sell the sizzle around change management and transformation management because it, it, it's, I find it fascinating. Lots of people find it fascinating, but so many people seem to hold back from it. And if you just lean into it, you, you, it's, a, it's a fulfilling career in itself. And you'll always have opportunities within organisations because things are happening to them internally, externally, every single day. So you, your business is going to be different in 12 months' time than it is today. Inevitable. And um, so if you've got that change mindset and you've got those change skills, you're always going to be in demand. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. It's the, as you said, it's inevitable in our world. You know, it started with, you know, this kind of change. Then there's, you know, agile transformation, digital transformations, business transformations. It's always, and then, you know, recently AI. AI's, you have to figure out what am I going to do with this because it's changing the way we work and, you know, e-commerce changed the way we work and now different various, you know, social media platforms that has a direct impact on businesses these days and, and so forth. So I, I'm totally with you on this. The more adaptable you are and, but, but adaptable with an understanding of the frameworks and so forth that'll help you get there. And so one that I usually try to I pull out 
early on is called the divergent convergent uh, framework. It's a fairly simple uh, framework, but it helps folks. It, it kind of brings down the stress of, of trying to understand like what's going on and so forth. And so first we'll start with divergent. Like what are all the different ways we can help? And this is how I get people involved. Like what are all the different ways? If this is our goal, what are all the ways we can do? And people start to brainstorm ideas. They see that you're receptive and open and you're explaining that divergent uh, mindset. But then there's a time to converge. So explain to them there's a time to diverge and a time to converge and converge. Now we're going to do red dot voting. We're going to try to focus on some of the things that you know you can change in your organization and so forth. And so I have found that to get people to start thinking that way, some people, as you say, some people will just get it and they and that's great. But then there's a lot of people who need to framework the mindset shift. Like, how do I make that mindset shift? Oh, so it's okay to diverge first, right? And to have a lot of thought and discussion before we converge. And I do have an input in the convergence and so forth. So I think this is going to help folks moving forward. And plus, the the other thing is, is in order to make a uh, a transformation uh, initiative successful is you have to load it up with experimentation. Mm -hmm. And what I love about experimentation is it doesn't mean this is absolutely what we're going to do. It means we we hypothesize this is what will work. And we're going to try it out. And the moment you use the word try, or at least in my experience, people's resistance goes down. Oh, we're just going to try it. Even though it actually, if it works, it will stick most likely because the people who are in the experiment are like, oh, this is great. This is the way they've had a, a you know part of the experiment. And next thing you know, you're moving in the right direction, whether it was a shift in culture, language, technology, whatever it is, they start to have that mindset and through experimentation, because it's not like we're going in and saying, this is what you must do. Instead, we're going to give you a framework of how to work, educate you, and now we're going to try some experiments. And oftentimes that feeds right into a uh, acceptance, and it ends up lowering that resistance and so forth and gets people more involved. You start looking, you identify who the local champions are and all that kind of stuff. So <laughs> it ends up working out well in the long run. No, totally agree. Totally agree. Um, I've just noticed the time. Time flies when you're having a, a good chat. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> uh, thank you very much for that. Just finishing off, sure, sure. Um, if there's sort of one thing that you want to leave people with, one sort of takeaway, one yeah. essential that um, you believe is critical for transformation success, what would that one thing be? It's treating your transformation as a high priority initiative. It means you're staffing it with a transformation team, you're prioritizing it above the other work, you're identifying detractors, personality types that are gonna help you and detract your org to your organization. You're gonna treat it as a journey that it is. You're gonna apply iterative and incremental thinking and planning throughout that transformation initiative. But it all starts with, am I treating this transformation as a first-class entity of work, a.k.a. initiative? Brilliant. Love that. Thank you very much. Absolutely. Thank you so much, Tony, for this opportunity. I do appreciate it. This is really great work that you're doing. I think the whole art and uh, science of, t of a transformation is incredibly important to many types of of you know agile digital business and so forth and so on and so i appreciate that you're doing this kind of work on behalf of all of us Brilliant. thanks thanks mario thank you for listening thank you for getting involved in this show we're always interested in hearing from you what would you find useful and what would you like us to explore further in in future episodes please do press subscribe now it helps us to share the message to a wider audience and attract bigger leaders, more experienced leaders to the podcast in future. Bye for now.